I'm Tom Clark. I'm a stone carver. I work here in Hearst Martock. Um, I run my own workshop here um, from which I do all sorts of different jobs. Varied really, you know, anything from sort of like community projects, gallery pieces, commissions, a bit of clay work, stone work, paint, anything really like that, you know, just it varies, a very varied job. Yeah, and then how did you, how did you first kind of get into, uh, I, get, I mean, would you call yourself an artist? Um, I'm going more and more towards that direction, you know, I started out doing sort of like, um, you know, trade work. Uh, as an apprenticeship, I did a monumental masonry, then I did ecclesiastical masonry, and I've done or did that for years, contract work, all, all over the place really. Um, but now, gradually, steadily, I'm sort of going away from that, more so, and doing my own thing really. So I try and make, uh, create my own sort of work really, in a way, by either making my own stuff and trying to sell it, or trying to find and conjure up sort of a, a project from somewhere or make a project out of nothing. I mean, this classic example is this gloving one really, is uh, an awareness uh, project. Uh, it's, a, it's a two joint thing really, because it enables me to engage with the community. And in turn, the idea of it is that they will engage with me, but it's an introductionary process where they'll meet me, I'll introduce them to other people. Um, so, you know, it's just making people are really aware in the community that these other characters are around that have done these sorts of work. You know, it's getting to be very fragmented now, and if we can try and um, bring people together, that's the that's the basis of the community idea. There's an end result, i.e., the carving, the sculpture, but the processes are where we are trying to cross boundaries with people, young young people in particular, to try and make them realise that these activities went on. But also, more than anything else, is just to start to not, it's not an us and them, you know, like old people, young people, it's trying to sort of like merge people together, so there's familiarity. And if you've got that in society, you have then a more of an opportunity to make things work in a community sense, because people know one another. And once they know one another, they, they, the barriers drop, and they're all in it together. So that's, that's the whole idea, it's trying to... Um, just get that off the ground really, bit by bit. It's quite tricky to do, but it's, it's working, you know, and um, it's engaging with people, so the end result will be a finished piece of work on the wall that, you know, individuals have been involved with. They've taken part in it, and then it's a conversational piece because it stimulates people to look at the work and say, oh, I used to be involved with that, and that, that's the sort of instruments or tools we used to use, and so it engages with people. That's, that's what I like to try and do if I can. Yeah. Not so sensationalist, I'm afraid. No, nothing like that. But it's, um, you said you started uh, out as more of a tradesman thing and stuff. Yes. Like How did you first get involved in that? Um, phew, very difficult, actually, because when I left school, I knew I wanted to do art of some description. Uh, I didn't go to college, and I knew I had to get some work to earn some money because I didn't have any money at all, so I couldn't muck about. I had to get on with it. So I was very keen on woodwork, actually, when I left school. Um, and I did try to do that. I got an apprenticeship trying to do that. And I went to the London College of Furniture, but it wasn't for me. It was just too, too many machines for my liking, really. So um, I ended up doing wood carving, went, got out of that, went into wood carving. Well, that was fantastic, but unfortunately the guy I worked for lost it and it all went bank he went bankrupt and it all fell apart. And then I went into stone carving with some Italians, worked with some Italians in a in a monumental masonry yard in Essex years ago. I worked for them for two and a half years. Um, and then they pushed me really from the carving side because it's very production orientated. If you're not earning your money whilst you're there, you know, they don't like that. So they put you on something that you can earn the money on. Obviously, they want to make their money um, to make it all happen. So I went into masonry and I got stuck with that for years, but I did enjoy it, I loved it. So when you say masonry, could you just explain what your role is? Uh, masonry, right. Masonry is the general sort of building construction side of uh, stonework on the cathedral. Rather than the uh, statutory or decorative element, it's the, the main structural elements of the, say, for instance, a church or a cathedral or a castle, you know, doors, windows, walls. It's all of the mould, we used to do all the handwork on the moulding where you see all of the 
Um, you know, you go around windows, all the decorative work that goes around windows, all the mouldings and the returns and cornices and all that sort of stuff really, general stuff, which generally is, 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 is straight work, you know, straight, you need a straight edge, a square, you do sinkings, all that. Well, I loved it, it's fantastic. But over, over the years, as I did that, I mean, I did sort of wander off and go back to where I originally wanted to start out with, and that was carving. And now I'm actually doing that, you know, I'm doing that now. But it's, it's been a long sort of journey to get to where I am now, really. Yeah, so how did you find, because obviously you would have learned your trade quite a lot for, through doing the masonry. Um, yeah. How, how did you find the transition from going, from doing something where you are a tradesman to becoming an artist? A very, I mean, because I had the background, the realistic grounding with the masonry as a trade, I had something to work on, so I knew I could um, lean on that if I knew it was a necessity. You know, for instance, if I got short of work. But I think it's just an evolutionary thing. You just gradually, with time, you just move on. You know, you, you, that's something I started out on. I enjoyed it. I can always do it again and still do occasionally. Um, but then you move on your ideas. You move on with more creative ideas. I wanted to do more sculptural ideas, you know, sort of where I was working off my own imagination, really. Um, so I've done that. So the transition has been a it's, a, it's not been a quick process, it's been a, you know, quite a long journey, but it's still going on now, really, you know, it still happens all the time, really, you know. It's tricky at times, you know, and things don't, I mean, it's tight at the moment, but um, things are beginning to move again slowly, but it's fits and starts, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it, really. But at the moment, it's quite, it's quite good, actually, at the moment, yeah. So what, what kind of people, who are the, the clients who do you make stone for at the moment? Varies really. Um, if I'm doing contracting work, it's, which I've just just recently been on a job, that guy is a quite a wealthy guy. He's having an awful lot of stone work doing, um, but it could equally be someone who is not so wealthy. You know, it depends if someone likes the style of work, and it's not excessively expensive. They may commission something, um, and that's a mixed bag. I and mean, commissions come. You know, again, if it starts, no rhyme or reason to it. You could go for months without anything coming through at all, but just making stuff and it sells. But people normally come round and knock on the door for something to be made. You know, it's memorials or fireplaces or quirky little carvings, for water features of gardens. You know, it's, it's endless, really. It's quite a lot to do, you know. So, so what's a typical day for you then in terms of like your workload? Um, typical day would be probably starting here about half seven. Um, just pick up from where I left before. I try if I can to try and keep on one particular project if I can, but it doesn't always work out like that. It's a funny, if you look around, you see lots of things on the go. What generally happens is you, you start something, you get it going, and then someone will phone you up and they want something that they know, you know they're going to get paid for or I will get paid for. So you tend to drop what you're doing because you know you're going to get some money off another job. If it's going to come through quicker sometimes, it does. Um, but also, when, you're, when I start things, you, you, you do go off track. I mean, something will disrupt you, you lose your train of thought, um, so you drop that and go on to something else. But I've got quite a lot of things on the go, uh, and that helps actually in a way, just having it sitting there. Um, so, you know, months, two months, three months time, you, you might get stuck on a particular piece and then you can just go to it, you've worked it out, it's there in front of you. Um, and you just pick up the tools and carry on with it. So, I mean, if you, if you look, there's bits and bobs around that are not finished. They will get finished eventually. Um, so, yeah, that's the day. It, it varies, every day is different. So, I spend most of the time either in here or outside chipping away, really. In terms of kind of being creative and also doing it as a business and the, the nature of the job, do you think um, to be a, a stone carver that you have to have a certain kind of personality or certain characteristics to be able to do the job? Um, yeah, yeah the, 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 the characteristics I would say is, is to be someone who's very methodical with your work, you know, and I've got a good grounding, background grounding in in you know work e ethics really um, and trial and error just says you've just got to stick with it I can't do anything else I've got to keep with it um, I enjoy doing it anyway um, so uh, yeah it's just a case of just carrying on and keeping with it really
Yeah, you mentioned trial and error. Can it go so badly wrong that you can't... Yeah, I mean, you, I think what happens is you start off... It depends how in, infected you are with your idea, really. Sometimes you get ideas that are so strong that you've just got to go with it and, uh, and everything else has got to be put aside to do it. And you just really... I think the thing is with it, although with all the years of experience, you always want to get there quicker. You can't always do that. And it's frustrating when you want to get something made and you can't necessarily make it happen when you want it to happen. So that can be frustrating. So that's trial and error, really. You've just got to stick it out and stick with it. But like anything you make or we make here, it's, it's, it's for a long time. You know, it's around for a long time. So the time element is insignificant, really, because it's going to be around for a long, long time. But you do get churned up sometimes when you're trying to make stuff um, to get it out there to sell, and you can't get there quick enough to do it, you know, that can be annoying, but... Um, I guess you also have to maintain quality throughout as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah. I tend to sort of really go at it, really go at it madly to get it all underway, you know, rough it all out and chip bits off here, there and everywhere and get some shapes in there. I think that's the energy side of it when you start off. It's quite physical, that bit, and I enjoy that bit. And then you sort of slow right down altogether and then you find that you see things in there you wouldn't have done when you're charging around, racing around all over the place, and you start to um, settle into your piece of work you're doing, you know, depending on what it is, of course. And you find there's always a new route there. You always find a new way there to get to an end result. It's quite interesting, really. Um, try and hopefully move on from the last piece you've made. You know, it doesn't always happen because you get... You do tend to get in a bit of a... Not rut, but um, a style develops, and you try and keep with it. I'm sure it's evolving, but you, you do tend to find to go back to the same sort of ways of doing thing, really, you know, but that, that's the way you are, really. I mean, do, do you find that you've developed your own style over the years? Yeah, you do, you do. I mean, I am, you are, I mean, there's a certain amount of influence out there, of course, but, um, I mean, mine's medieval, early, naive work. I really like naive arts, paintings, sculpture. Could you what? describe what, that, what the look of that is, then, naive? I like um, stiff, lumpy, heavy, figurative work, you know, nothing, um, but not crude, quite delicately done. Um, I, I enjoy looking at that sort of work, I like moving lines particularly. Um, so I like the naivety approach of it, so sort of awkward angles and, you know, elbows that wouldn't really work and, you know, fingers that are a bit tight and knotted perhaps, but... I, I like that, I really do like that sort of work. That's what I'd strive to do, sort of simplifying all the time as possible, as you best you can, because I like figurative work, really. Um, so, um, although I do do other things, um, not that you'd recognise it. <laughs> um, but, um, so, you know, there's elements in there that I like. I just, I like children's work. I mean, I work with children quite a lot, so I like their, their drawing style and their approach. It's very instant and to the point, which is I like. Is that with the term with naive, the, the idea that it is quite a childlike? Um, the, yeah, I, suppose, I, I don't really know. I mean, you, you do see some really sort of renowned artists that have reverted back to naivety, you know, in their, their approach. I think it's just short-cutting, you know, they're just cutting the nonsense out and they're just getting to the basics, bare bones of an image, you know, without all the frilliness around it, really. Um, so I do like that. And as I say, with children, you can get that instantaneously. You know, the drawings are just, we, we just finished a project we did at Glastonbury at the festival, and that was for um, working with some children there, not at the, at the festival, the, the, from the school, and we took it to the festival. And they um, produced some drawings, animals in our environment, and um, we had to copy their drawings and carve them. So it worked out really well, actually. You know, some really five-legged um, badgers and foxes <laughs> four times as long as they should be. But it was really good, yeah. And also you mentioned about letting go at the end of the piece of work. Do you know when to finish? Yeah, difficult one, that one, really. Yeah. Um, you have to be realistic. I found I've had to be realistic with it because um, you have to let go um, because you've got to move it on. You've got to sell it and you can carry on. The worst thing that can happen is if the longer you leave it, the intervals between starting a piece, and there's a month, six weeks between each individual revisit, shall we say, your, your mind changes, your eyes change, your attitude changes, so you make changes to what you consider to be okay before. 
So it does tend to go round a bit. That's the evolutionary bit coming out again, where, you, where you've moved on and you're doing different things and you look at things differently. So you have to draw the line. Um, and the majority of cases you draw that line, I draw that line, and knowing that, you know, I'm glad it's finished, I'll be on to the, oh, you're looking forward to the next one. That's what I do, you know, I, I look forward to, it's not that I'm fed up with it necessarily, it's just that you, you've, you've had enough of that one now and you need to move on, do something different. So, and you know that it, you will only sell it for X amount of pounds, so you can't really, you know, put too much more into it because you won't get it back. So I suppose a sense of realism comes into it there, really. Have you ever done a piece of work where you, you struggled letting go with it at the end? No, no, not at all, no. I like to move on to the next one. I find the, the, the excitement for me is the initiation, just getting down that instant. It's a, it's a very quick um, flash, really. You've got an idea. You almost, you don't see it finished, but you've got enough um, of an idea where you could go with it. And that's the exciting bit, is when you start out with a lump of stone and you've probably got done a drawing perhaps months or weeks before and you, and you just hit into the stone and the energy is really built up in the first processes when you're getting that off, you know, moving that material. Um, so that passes, you know, that instant passes and you, it takes on another life as you, as you carry on with it to develop those ideas. So yeah, no, I, I know I'm, I'm ready for the next one each time. It doesn't worry me at all. No, I don't get pressures about it, no. Yeah. I should do, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, um, in terms of the process, though, when you do get that, that lump of stone, yeah. um, wh where do you begin and what happens straight after that? Do you just start tapping away or is there... No, I don't. I really, I like to, um, you know, get the punch out or get the grinder if necessary, if it's really big, get cuts into it and start taking lumps off, you know, get depending on how the stone starts out, if it comes out fairly square, you know, sawn, generally is because I buy off cuts that are already like that. But if I were, I don't often buy it, but I do see them in the quarry, just random lumps. But I tend to go for stuff that's got sort of faces on it, really, because that's just the way I buy it. Um, and it's a case of just getting rid of all those faces, getting, the, getting those sawn edges away. So the flatness disappears, so you can start to work into the stone, put some shape into that. Um, so that's very, very physical because it's, you know, majority of the stone's portal, so it's quite hard. So it's a really, you know, lay into it. And then it's, you know, it's that energy thing, surge, as I was saying earlier on, that you really just hit into it and start taking corners off and start developing a shape into it. And then you sort of, not wear yourself out, but that sort of dissipates. You, that go, you go through that phase and then you go into a slower mode where you start to think it through more so, you know, you, you can see certain shapes or twists and turns in there or where the hair is going to go or the feet or the clothing or if it's a couple of figures together, you're trying to work all that out. So you get into another sort of gear really, you start to sort of suss it, you know, you've done the hard, the physical work, you start to really sort of move the stone around with shapes and playing around with it like that and then move it on from there really and it can be I don't know, you know, it could be four weeks, six weeks. I don't think I spent more than on one piece of stone, more than six, eight weeks on one piece of stone. That's, I think that's my limit, actually. I mean, after that, I'd get, I think I'd get bored, actually. I might, uh, I couldn't do it any longer than that at that given time. I'd have to do it up to that point and then leave it and then come back, perhaps. But the longest I've ever done uh, a piece was about, yeah, say six weeks. Yeah. And so, um, in terms of when you actually start uh, cutting away and the toughness, how long will that, that tough patch be where you've got to be fit and moving about? Um, it could be, well, it depends on the size, but as a general one, the, say a head or just a torso, or I don't know, day, two days perhaps. It depends on the size of it, really. But, um, yeah, I would say about that sort of, I mean, you could... You could go on um, for longer than that. Depends what you're trying to create, really. But if it's quite, um, yeah, no, I would say probably about that's so about day, two days would be a, about the maximum, really, I'd put into it. The physical bit, yeah. The physical bit, yeah. And then, then the, the, sl the slowest bit is the finishing. The finishing takes forever. It takes forever. It really does take a long time. But if you don't get that bit right, 
The finishing sort of leads on to the style. So if you don't get the finishing right, you can't develop that finish, you can't get that style to work. So one follows the other, really. You've got to go through the processes of doing the hard, you know, physical work, which is great. And then you go into another stage where you start shaping. And then when you start putting chisels on for finishing work, that starts to develop the stone in another way, it makes a different feel to it altogether. Um, and you tend, as I was saying, you lean back on old familiar habits and that's the style element of your, the way people work. You know, everyone has a different way of, of um, portraying their ideas, you know. Some could do it perhaps with a really rough finish and that would be adequate for them. I wish I could do that sometimes, it would be a lot quicker. <laughs> perhaps I will one day. But for the time being, mine tend to be quite fiddly finishing, you know, and that's, it develops a style, you know, the finish looks good. Uh, it takes time to do, so um, I'm stuck with that for the time being, so I'll keep with it. Yeah. And in terms of, has it always just been you, or is there kind of... An, uh... No, I have, I've had people work with me, but not necessarily on this sort of, um, this environment, where you're trying to create, when you're trying to create, really, you, I find it a bit of an, in, it's very, it's not ideal to have someone around, you know, you need to... Uh, you need to have your own little world, really, in space um, and do a lot of things yourself. It's just that, it's just, um, I find it easier rather than dictating someone else. A lot of the time I can't anyway because I've got the money and the job to do it for, for a start. Um, so I tend to do it from start to finish. But if I'm contracting and doing other works, then I'll bring people in. But as a general rule for my own work, I've had people rough out before which is fine, but I do tend to, the roughing outside is quick, and I have mountains of work left behind me that I'll never get to, you know, because I just don't have time to do it. So I just do my own stuff, really, you know, from start to finish. And also getting to be your own boss, is, uh, what's it like freelancing in Somerset? In Somerset? Um, great, it's good. I mean, I've done it for a long time now, um, and it's a case of just, keep on plodding away really you don't really let up you don't uh, I don't really give it much thought you just carry on um, but you know to work for people I've worked for quite a lot of people around here um, all over the place and uh, it's good yeah there's plenty of work plenty of interest in the arts around here um, commissions come in every now and then quite surprising who's around um, yeah I've had some very nice work around here very nice yeah and also in terms of the future of the business, is there kind of, their fa have you got family members that have taken an interest? Not at the moment I haven't, no, no, I can't say that's the case at the moment. Although I've got uh, Molly and Bert, i am not shown any signs of being interested at the moment. But, you know, I, I think everyone to their own, you know, they either they want to do it or they don't, you know, and if they want to, it's here. If they want to do anything, it's great. But um, I think you've just got to let people go the way they feel happiest, really. You can't make, it's not a business in the respect of, you know, churning out, and it's not a family business, it's just me. Um, so, you know, and I'm just doing my own thing, really, creative bits and bobs, so whether it continues or not, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really worry me, that side of it at all. If it were to more traditionally based, I would be more concerned because I'd like to uphold the skills, you know, the craft skills, but I'm not really in that league, really, now. You know, anyway, I'm out of that, really, so... Yeah, no, no signs of any um, one being interested at the moment. And also, have you ever been? Because um, obviously, there is a kind of a bit of a legacy with stonework because it, it it will kind of live on for as however long it does. Yeah. So have you ever been? Um, have you ever been somewhere not knowing that your work's there and discovered it, or kind of come across your work? Not really, no, because not really, no, um, because as a general rule, if it's decorative work, I mean, if it's general masonry, I mean, that's, you wouldn't probably recognise it because it's, it sort of uh, merges in with the rest of the work there, you know, if it's like a jar, door jam or a hood moulding or mullion or something like that, you, you wouldn't, you know, there's no way of recognising that unless it's really not well done or something like that. It's completely different to everyone else's. But with um, decorative work, I mean, you do... You keep a portfolio of all your works. You, you know where they're going to go. Um, it, and I do often go around and see bits and pieces on buildings. You know, just go just out of curiosity, just go and have a perk up and have a look on up at the top of a building or something like that. If it's still there, um, a bit of memory lane, really. I suppose, really, have a look at it again. It's quite it's quite nice. Um, so that that's the, you know you, I'm always 
proud of the fact that I've done something like that. You, know, you can wander around the countryside and look at bits and bobs and it's there, you know, everyone can see it and uh, it'll be there for a long time, which is a nice feeling really. Is, is there a piece of work that you're particularly proud of or kind of you see as a, a favourite that's exhibited anywhere? Well, the one I'm doing at the moment, the glove, the gloving one is probably, it's, it's the one I'm on at the moment, it's proudest, you know, and then I move on from that really. The gloving one I'm really, it's, it's, it's one I've handled myself, trying to engage with people. Um, very interesting subject matter. Um, it could go a lot further, but I'm limited on funds with it really. It could go a lot, lot further. Uh, so I'm proud of that. I like that one. It's simple, but it's, 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 um, it means an awful lot to me. It's, it's a local one, it's Martok. Um, it means I've dealt with people as well. And it, so it's more, that to me has a lot, quite a lot of resonance really, because it's more of a personalised thing, because it's, it's introducing other people into the, you know, to the bigger picture as it were really. So it's not just something you're looking at on the wall, it's something else that's behind that, you know the uh, time you spent together organising it, you know, the initiation. So that I, look at it, I look at it quite differently in that respect. So I would say the last job I ever do is my, the best one until the next one comes along, really.